Welcome to this panel discussion, No More Pandemics, the pathway to healthier and more resilient societies. My name is Sarah Thompson, and I'm the lead policy specialist for health and sexual and reproductive health and rights at CEDA. And I will be the moderator for today's session. This seminar is based on the common understanding here and globally that the COVID-19 pandemic was at its very core based on systems failures. Now, there are a lot of systems that we could focus on, but today we're going to focus on the health system. All of us here, as with nearly every human being in the world, was confronted with some aspect of the health system failing, whether it was because of lack of data and information, access to tests or PPEs, or lack of access to basic health services. And yet, there are ways that it could have been avoided. And now we have to implement those solutions. Each member of this panel has experience of reacting to the health system failures or perhaps successes in different ways. And today we'll hear about those experiences and what they think has to be done to prevent future pandemics. To my right is Karen Yemtin. She's the uh, Director General of CEDA, which she's been such since 2017, and previously has been also our Development Cooperation Minister, Secretary General of the Social Democratic Party, and Vice Chair of the Stockholm County Council. And she's a longtime defender of democracy and human rights. Anders Nordström is to her right. He's Sweden's ambassador for global health, and he's based at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here. He's a physician by training with many years of experience in international development, including with the Swedish Red Cross, CEDA, and the World Health Organization. And from 2020 to 2021, he was the head of the Secretariat of the International Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response. To Anders' right is Eleni Aklilu. She's a professor of tropical pharmacology, a senior research scientist and research group leader at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. She has over 20 years of experience leading several clinical pharmacology and clinical uh, trials research projects, focusing on treatment and prevention of various infectious diseases, including HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and various neglected tropical diseases. And to her right is Martin Arnlöf, and he's been the Secretary General of the Swedish Red Cross since 2018, and before that he was active in both the private sector and the civil society. So warm welcome to this very esteemed panel and to all of you sitting here today. I'm going to be asking the panel a couple of questions each and then opening it up for questions. So please note um, if you have a burning question that you would love to ask them. First off, Karin, yes. how did CEDA respond to the immediate health system needs during the pandemic? Big question, two and a half, three minutes, something to answer. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, as you said, as you rightly pointed out, we were all affected rapidly and instantly, at more or less at the, on the same sort of day, nearly the whole world closed down. And that was uh, maybe one of, I was about to say, our assets and an opportunity because we all had to act in more or less the same way. Uh, we decided that uh, I, we decided to adopt, um, adapt rather portfolios. We ad decided to allocate new funds directly to uh, to to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, but we also made sure to support entire health systems in different ways. But apart from working directly with the virus uh, or with stopping and, and stopping the spread of COVID, we also tried to maintain the other work at the same time. And I actually think that was important for the work to stop the spreading of the virus. We continue to work with democracy and human rights. We put money onto social uh, services, social cash transfer um, programs in different countries to avoid people to having being forced out into to in out into the, out of their where they lived out out of their houses in different ways and that also stopped the spreading of the virus um but we when we needed to as i said we adapted our portfolios in different ways between 
March 20 and April 21, we adapted over 300 ongoing contributions. And for those of, ones of you having worked with development aid or with any kind of partner, you know that's a lot of work and it has to be a lot of work. But we also reallocate, we reallocated over 1.6 billion Swedish crowns to com combat the pandemic uh, and ease the effects of it. But we also provided new support. Um, we provided new support to the immediate needs. Around 700 million crowns went directly to halting the spread of the virus. So we worked in different ways, actually, when, when it struck the globe. We did different things with these supports. Of course, uh, supported by health services, services to be kept open and to reach out to people stay, staying at homes, but also adapting uh, maternal and child health services in different ways, training of, of health workers in different ways, etc., etc. And I, maybe I should say a thank you to Anders, because, but as especially we asked you about what happened around Ebola. Mm. And that is my, maybe one lesson that we should all learn. There are very few unique, unique things happening on the globe. And one can always learn from the past. And we learned from what happened at the Ebola outbreak 2014 to 16, but also at other times. So thank you, Anders, for that experience. Exactly. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Karin. Um, Indeed, there was, uh, there was a precedence. Uh, I would spread of uh, COVID-19 now again here. We might, but I think we have a very good situation in Sweden right now with a lot of people being immunized. But, Karen, you said about the lessons. I do not think that the world has, is learning the lessons. The lessons are clear, but is the world taking action? The first thing we did with the panel was to review 16 previous panels' reports seeing that the recommendations were made that could potentially have stopped this outbreak becoming this kind of pandemic. No actions. There was a report now that was released um, a little bit more than a month ago, a year follow-up to see what has happened. The title was Transforming or Tinkering. The message was that nothing has changed. We still have the same systems, we have the same procedures, people are into processes, there are no decision taking, we are in a worse situation than what we were three years ago. So deep worry, not about COVID here, but that we will have a new pandemic if we are not prepared, because we will have, there's no question about that we will have an out out outbreak of most likely the same kind of virus, most likely more dangerous, more deadly, but we have not taken action. So what the panel recommended was basically five things, not rocket science. First thing, make sure that all countries are reporting promptly. Make sure that you allow WHO to go to that country and validate whether this is something dangerous or not. I mean, saying Swedish government should say, we would love WHO to come to Malmö if we have an outbreak of something. That should be in all countries' interest. That is not, there is no international agreement on this today. National sovereignty is more important that a safe, than a safe world. First thing, make sure that we get an effective, modern surveillance and alarm system that people understand. Second, we need a different kind of platform to ensure, if worse happen, that we have access to vaccines and diagnostic and treatment in a different way than today. Not primarily for equity reasons, but for an effective flow of those tools if an outbreak happens again. We can't immunize 80% here in Sweden and then 10% in the rest of the world. That's not an effective way of ending a pandemic. So we need a platform where we have an agreement on those principles up front, politically. Those are political decisions, not technical. Third thing, we need money. We need money to be invested in preparedness now, including in Sweden. When I was working with the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, we did investment in preparedness during the Ebola outbreak. Is Sweden doing that today? No. Is the rest of the world doing that today? No. But then we need also rapid money if something happens again. Big money. The World Bank put 12 billion US dollars on the table for vaccines, but not being available until many, many months too late. Fourth, we need a stronger and more independent WHO. High technical quality of the work of WHO. And last, we need political uh, engagement at the highest level that cuts across sectors that are able to take make decisions in, if something happens. What we saw at the beginning of the outbreak was China and US not agreeing on anything. We need a platform where senior political leaders are actually accepting to take political responsibility if something happens. So five things, quite easy. Surveillance, 
a platform for vaccines, more financing, an independent, stronger WHO, and a political platform where you can actually have true political leadership. Not that difficult, but still, no decisions this far. Nope. That's uh, very informative, but pretty depressing. Uh, thank you, Anders. Um, Eleni, addressing a, pandem a pandemic presupposes the capacity to detect, identify, contain, and report it. That was one of Anders's points. Pandemics, the engagement to a local location is very important. And that means there's investment in vaccinology, clinical trial, and technology transfer, and working together. This is the thing that we need to really missed uh, from the pandemics and we learn from this and the other development research in epidemiology vaccinology and public health sectors sh should be more investment in development research focusing on low-income countries together together with uh, uh, Europe even Sweden has been leading a lot of uh, joint collaborative research that we have been doing funded by CEDA and also European Union under the ADCTP so there was more funding for research and the other one is regulatory capacity Regulatory capacity is needed in the global south, particularly for monitoring of safety of new diagnostics, treatment, and vaccines. These are the things that we really need to focus on, and the capacity needs strengthening. Excellent. I mean, these are just nuts and bolts of any public health system that makes us, you know, public health specialists just thrilled. But I'm sure to many people, it just doesn't sound sexy. You know, it just feels like, what, these are just, you know, boring nuts and bolts. But as you say, it, if this is exactly what has to be put into place in every single country, has to have this capacity to monitor, to detect, and to report, which, which relies on those just nuts I'm talking about, right? Research, epidemiologist, capacity in the, in the uh, local government health systems. Um, and I just want to say, you use the, the um, acronym EDCTP, which yes. stands for? European and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership, to which uh, it's under EU funding for the focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa for now on global health. Previously, it was on clinical trial. And CEDA and Sweden are one of the more contributing funding for EDCTP, apart right. from the EU. Great. Thank you so much, Eleni. So moving from uh, research to civil society and humanitarian actors, uh, Martin, um, how can the Red Cross and other civil society actors mobilize local communities uh, both for preparedness and for response in the event of an outbreak. Mm, well, thanks for that. Uh, then I think uh, my, my answer in a way starts where the previous ones uh, ended. And, and what I will say goes beyond what we would normally uh, label as a health system, right? And I would also start with... with um, and I will answer not from the Swedish Red Cross perspective, of course, but from the Red Cross Red Crescent movement throughout the world, which means that we have a 192 nation presence and 14 million volunteers, which are really the thing in the Red Cross movement. If I start with the Ebola, I mean, one of the things that the Red Cross movement learned from the Ebola virus treatment was uh, the importance of having uh, safe and dignified burials committed by local people whom the local villages trust. Because it's a little bit scary if people show up looking like something that's coming out of outer space to take care of their loved ones, right? So having that procedures in place by people that you trust is extremely important if you treat the virus like Ebola. Now, if we take the, the, the situation now with the COVID, uh, I would say that... that uh, this goes beyond health systems as we define it in the talk here. This talks about outreach and about trust building. Uh, I had the chance in October to travel uh, Somalia, Mozambique and Kenya, three countries that at the time all had uh, below 5% vaccination rate for COVID. Uh, COVID was a challenge, of course. Uh, the real challenge was even reaching people for vaccination. It was at that point not perceived as having a shortage of doses by people in the country. The real threat was that we did not have a way to get the doses from the airport to the arms. Because what you need to build on in that case is an infrastructure of maybe mobile health clinics 
small health clinics where we normally uh, maybe are at the stage where we can vaccinate small babies and where the mothers trust the organization locally. But instead, we found the people were afraid. There was superstition beyond my, my understanding. Right? If you get vaccinated, you will be impotent. If you're a man, you will never be pregnant. You will become a Christian or a Jew in a 10-year period. I mean, absurd facts circulating. Then you need to have a local presence over time in order to, to reduce that uncertainty. And that is also part of how you treat these kind of things. Red Cross has met 300 million people in the COVID campaign. Information, trust building, uh, we have vaccinated 45 million or so. Uh, not that many, because there we have to have the, the, the government structure and the health clinics primarily, of course, run by the, by the state or the, the medical system. But building that kind of trust, being local, being there all the time, and you build the structure also on that. That is as important in Sweden as it is in, in Sub-Saharan or Africa, for example. So that would, that would, that, that's how I would take it in the first round. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. I'm glad you pointed out that many people don't consider community-based health care as part of the formal health care system. But of course it is. It is part of the whole health care system in any country. Um, some countries have a more developed system where you actually have paid community health workers. Um, others where you use volunteers, um, outreach officers, you know, people walking the streets, that kind of stuff. Um, and so incredibly important getting the actual getting the vaccines that the researchers have, have developed into the arms of the people who need them. Um, and that's where uh, community-based uh, organizations uh, really come into play. So thank you for pointing that out. So, Karin, back to you. The IPPBR uh, report that Anders mentioned um, made a number of recommendations um, on how to prevent future pandemics. And some were global mechanisms and some were national or regional initiatives. What do you see as the role of CEDA and other development partners in preventing future pandemics and mitigating their potential effects? I think that Martin gave the answer. Mm, <laughs> Try and okay. continue support uh, <laughs> work that really reaches um, mm. uh, into, uh, the, uh, to the country level yep. uh, in different ways. Yep. By supporting um, yeah, healthcare in the really rural areas, but also in the other end, sort of supporting research mm. or supporting training of nurses. Yep setting up systems, etc., etc. So basically, we would work at country level with very concrete interventions of different kinds, supporting countries' own um, priorities in this field, and then supporting at global level, WHO or others continue to do their work in different ways. And then, as I said, we have a big, quite a substantial anyway, research component that's here, and that can be used in, has been used and will be used also in the future for this field. One important thing that was not pointed out in the panel, but which is important to always remember, is that humanitarian aid will never sort this out. We have to continue press for the long-term development cooperation part of, of the development budget being substantial. Uh, and a very big majority of the budget in every country, in every donor country. Otherwise, if humanitarian aid grows at the expense of the long-term development cooperation aid, we will never reach the situation that Martin described before. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is an ex an, a very important part for us to continue press for. Great. I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that. And I'm also happy to hear that you see uh, a role for CEDA in, in health systems. Very many. That means I'll still have a job in the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karin. Um, Anders, um, same sort of question to you. What do you see as the role of the foreign ministry um, and governments, other governments, not just Sweden, to ensure that there are no more pandemics and disruptions to people's health and well-being? No, thank you. Uh, 
I mean, first to start, that this pandemic is not just about stopping the virus and the vaccine. I mean, this has disclosed that in societies we have people with no access to basic health services. I mean, the community issues here in terms of how you actually enable people then to make those right decisions for themselves, to protect themselves. Uh, there was a study just released now this morning from Sweden that the ones most affected were at the beginning in the intensive care, men in between 50 and 75 years old, being a bit obese, diabetes and hypertension. So we need also to understand the underlying risk factors and a bit of gender knowledge here as well, really to understand. So this pandemic has not only been about stopping the virus with vaccines, even if we have Gabi sitting here. The role of the ministry here is, of course, to create, um, in some way, the conditions to provide some guidelines to CEDA, uh, provide money uh, to CEDA. So, I mean, the work that CEDA is doing in terms of what, the bilateral cooperation, but not just in health, I would say, in all other sectors as well, extremely important to have a more resilient society for the future. But then, of course, also supporting the multilateral organizations. And, and again, Gavi being the vaccine. Um, so th the political here is really, really important. And that is partly what we are working on. And also, not, it's not just working in solidarity with, if I may say, so African countries. I was now in a debate in Brussels with one of the leaders from the African Union. What we've seen happening with the African Union during the last five, ten years, amazing. They are big. My question to them was, will you allow us to be a partner to you? because that is what is happening now with the African Union when it comes to politically, but also resources. So the paradigm that we are helping solidarity help in the rest of the world, forget that. Now we are entering in an era where we need to do this together. And we need to do this together if we're going to manage this for the future. So, I mean, for Sweden, politically, uh, uh, we had a follow-up meeting with a panel here in Stockholm just a couple of weeks ago, um, talking about how can we move this agenda now with the pandemic treaty being one important ingredient in this, a stronger WHO with a totally reformed financing, allowing the independence of WHO. Uh, a new platform then for the vaccine for the future. Big evaluations happening now. We will be key into that dialogue. Um, a high-level meeting in New York with the UN General Assembly. There is a resolution on the table now to call for the highest possible level of political commitment for a reform agenda of the international system. And Sweden is right into that. Great. Thank you so much, Anders, for pointing out also and reminding us all that uh, development is not just about money, but also about dialogue. Um, could you just explain for everybody what is the pandemic treaty? A pandemic treaty is, uh, if some of you were in other panels, they were talking about the t tobacco convention that sets the rules for the world, how you can then, or basically how we can stop the use of tobacco. Uh, a treaty is a convention that sets the international rules in terms of how you need to report, how you need to have the right capacity in place, how you need also to be able to respond if something is happening. So it's a rule sort of framework for the future. Uh, and a convention, a treaty works in the way that um, you have an opt-in, so you need to ratify it. Your parliament needs to ratify it. The most ratified convention right now in the world is the Child Convention. All countries, I think, except the US, apologizing, Jimmy, has signed that. Uh, Tobacco Convention, I think there is some 170 countries that, or governments that have signed today. So a convention is a, the legal framework that will provide a better framework for the future, making us hopefully, hopefully. a better position. Thank you. So, Eliani, and I think we all agree with Anders that there has to be a political will as, as well as capacity, but uh, we asked you here to talk about capacity building in your, um, in your role at Karolinska Institute and, and in the uh, cooperation that you do with the EDCTP, amongst others. Um, in what ways were existing capacities shared across continents and, and how was local capacity mobilized or strengthened uh, during the pandemic? Thank you, Sarah. This is a very good question. And I just want to add just what Anders said, that the, the, the political will, in addition to the capacity that is established, is a key. Yeah. That's what I just want to stress. <laughs> and then... And, and, and about the capacity, how it was shared, for example, in the Global South, the government were shifting all available resources and funding to uh, tackling the pandemics. That means neglecting an ongoing, overstretched 
public health system to prevent and treat HIV, malaria, neglected tropical diseases, which are costing the highest rate of mortality in that, in that region. And that means it will, it's affecting the success that has been achieved during the past 10 and 20 years of investment to control these diseases has now probably negatively affected because of the pandemics. So mobilizing funds and resources within the public health system has really affected a lot ongoing, exi already existing public health problems. This is one. The other thing is that not so many countries, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, had the capacity to do genomic sequencing, to identify new variants and report. Mm. That is a limitation, but with knowledge transfer, capacity building and collaboration, now it is starting. Mm -hmm. And preparedness for pandemic prevention, detection and management is ongoing now. That is handled by uh, African Union and African CDC together with European CDC. This is a very good Im Im impact that the, the world has learned from the pandemics. Mm -hmm. And this joint collaboration is very important. Solidarity is very important. Mm -hmm. This is how the, and at the beginning of the pandemics, there was like pr protection of knowledge. Mm -hmm. But in this global health emergency, protection of knowledge is very not really productive because we need to be, the time is a factor for us to develop vaccines and mitigate the impact of the pandemics. So there are such research ethics that we should really stop and consider. Do we really need to have a patent on this? Or do we need to save the world? These are the dilemmas that the world has been facing during the pandemics. And there is a lot of pro and cons in, in doing so. At the same time, not jeopardizing the need to invest in new knowledge. At the same time, what is best for the world? This is at, uh, how, how I see the pandemics in terms of capacity sharing. Yeah, these are in fact, in effect, global goods. Yes, is what you're saying. Yeah, and could you also just explain terminology? Uh, the African CDC. What does that mean? Center for Disease Control. The African Union has established uh, recently, just two or three years ago, to lead at a national, at, at a regional level in Africa, to monitor and control uh, infectious diseases. And under African CDC just like European Central Disease Control, they have established preparedness for, for pandemic handling, surveillance, reporting, and capacity building, together with the WHO and uh, help from European Union and also from the West. And from CEDA. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Eleni. Um, Martin, how can civil society actors hold governments accountable for their responsibilities, uh, including just basic health services in pandemic preparedness, both domestically and globally? And then you mean apart from taking part in panels in Almedal, and I assume, right? Yeah, well, it's a start. It's yeah, a start. well, no, but, but I, I think uh, it's... When we talk about this, it, it's, it is really easy to get depressed and, and to see the high mountain and the, the, all the work that still needs to be done. And that is true. And it, it's really important to keep on going on this one. But it's also so that what you do have, have an effect, right? So let me give a, a more bright example. On the same trip that I referred to earlier, I also visited the Kamiti Maximum Security Prison in Nairobi. Well, in Sweden now, there is a political debate about the overcrowdedness of, 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 of the prison system in Sweden. That is not comparable if you look, look to the overcrowdedness of, of a Kenyan prison. It's a lots of people in a very, very small space. Uh, they had a vaccination rate of 88%. They had barely had any COVID cases, luckily enough, because if they had, most have been severely ill. And that was thanks to basically, I mean, the cooperation between the Kenyan Red Cross, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the knowledge that professional people are providing and a listening government authority in that case. The, the, because the prison system of Kenya was really keen on making sure that they did not have massive COVID outbreaks in the already super overcrowded prisons. So that it matters what we do. So locally, Building that kind of knowledge, getting at it, continuing with the programs, that is extremely important. In a country like this one, uh, 
I think it's important to talk to governments and to people like Karin that localiza localization of global aid is extremely important to build the capacities locally to channel support to people. It, I mean, when I met recently, my, uh, recent, uh, reason, uh, very recently I met my colleague again from Kenya because she was here to participate in the climate conference. Then I asked, of, of course, uh, to her, uh, what, what is the situation like the, uh, with the COVID now? And then she looks at me and, and then she says, of course, well, you know, we are on our force drought, following the flooding, following the locust invasion, and locust is grasshopper in Swedish. And then we have the 80% unemployment rate from the COVID lockdowns on people below 30 years. So that is also something that, of course, gets into the total picture when we talk about these things. That when we have a Swedish perspective on a welfare state, it's completely different context. And that's why, why people like Anders and Karin need to build that kind of actions into that setting. And we, from civil society, also need to push on our end or drill the tunnel from both ends, so to speak. So keep on doing that and not lose faith and not lose hope because in the end you get there. Thank you so much um, for those words. And also thank you for reminding us that the enormous financial losses that many countries had uh, because of the pandemic, because of the shutdowns. And, uh, and a lot of people don't talk about this, and now we're already in another crisis. That's one problem with the food crisis, which we do also need to talk about. But the World Bank did a study uh, recently that showed um, many countries now it's going to take them five years just to get back to the same low level of health system delivery and health, del you know, basic health um, uh, basic health care being delivered, um, as, you know, before the pandemic. So that was already very low because in some countries, 80% of health care costs come directly out of the pocket of patients. So now we're talking about, and Eleni, you also mentioned the, the, um, the backsliding that we did also in, in um, just for example, I think children's vaccination, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Stefan, I, I think it was 10 years, they say. We've, we lost 10 years. So the enormous financial cost as well of just getting everything back on track. And now we're expecting them to build up a pandemic preparedness and response system and keep up basic health care and train new epidemiologists. Um, so it's uh, quite overwhelming, but I still detect a note of optimism here. No, no, just one thing. I mean, it might sound like this is a crazy priority to invest more in this because there are other problems that are much bigger, 100% correct. But as we saw the indirect impact being so huge yep. now during the last two years, we need to be smarter and more effective to stop it more quicker, more che cheaper and more effectively. But to say that the other priorities we don't care about, <coughs> that's why I'm deeply, deeply concerned that we just let this opportunity go again Absolutely. without doing the necessary things. So we can stop because we will have another one and it will be even worse. Yep. But there are other, and you, I'd never answer your question about how we manage the trade-offs then without the needs for other health services. And I think this is, I mean, this is really where health systems and people leaders need to be smarter to really to understand what is really having an impact on people's health, both short-term and long-term. It's about risks. If you lock people in, yes, you will stop the outbreak, but you will have other side effects on people's health. And you need to be aware about what are the risks and the trade-offs here, mm -hmm. both in terms of cost, the long-term, the short-term, uh, and to be aware about this, and also taking sort of open, transparent decision in terms of why are you doing this. But um, unfortunately, we will have more outbreak of new viruses that will be even worse, and we need to be more effective to stop them so that we don't get into the same situation again, unfortunately. Yeah, I agree. Um, I want to let in some, prepare your questions, but Martin, you wanted to say something? No, a, a quick comment here to answer or a question. Uh, maybe I'm in deep water now, but I would still claim that the world is better prepared when it comes to Ebola today than we, what we was 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so I think, I mean, humankind is a learning species. So, I mean, your point is ab absolutely right. We cannot stop 
build primary health care systems or develop faster and smarter vaccines and learn, is it locked down or is it a faster vaccine? Of course we need to do that, right? Uh, but, but my point is that we need to understand that the full chain is needed. I mean, lots of cool containers with vaccine doses on an airfield is not doing the job when it sits there. And then we have to have those structures also going all the way. Yeah, you know that. But uh, so, so, so we learn as, as, as human beings all along. We are better with the Ebola now. We hopefully will be better with, with the next But virus. the countries that have the experience from Ebola is not the US and the UK. And the countries that have experience from Ebola, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, DRC, they are really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. But when we looked at the ranking of the countries in the world who was best prepared to deal with this situation, the US and the UK came highest. How well did they do? So this is no longer about only what we speak mm. about the countries in the south not having the capacity. Sometimes they have actually more capacity than what yeah. we have here. Yeah. And what we have faced now is not a problem about that some African countries did not react. It's about how we dealt with this also in high-income countries. Mm, yep. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the reminder. So I would like to uh, uh, take some questions. Yes, so please, uh, do we have a microphone? And uh, say your name and if you like where you're from or where you work, if you want. And just a, a yep. brief and okay. concise question, please. Okay, thank you. So, uh, my name is Niklas Arnberg. I'm a professor of virology at Umeå University and chairman for the Swedish Society of Virology. First of all, I would just like to thank the panel for being very honest about the threats coming from different virus caused diseases. I'm not sure if I have a question. I would just <laughs> like to support what you're doing, thank your you. great work, and also emphasize the risk about virus caused infections. WHO has announced global emergencies no less than six times during the la la last 13 years, and all of them has been caused by pandemics, uh, by, by viruses. And in a recent Nature uh, publication, it was stated that within the next 50 years, there will be no less than 4,000 zoonotic events, which means uh, situations when viruses can cross the species barrier to humans, from animals to humans. Of course, there will not be 4,000 pandemics during the next 50 years, but there will be more threats like this. And yeah. why is it like this? That is because we're 8 billion people on the Earth right now. We travel more than we have ever done before. We cut down rainforests, we impoverish the biological diversity, so we expose ourselves to viruses in a way that we have never, never done before. Yeah. So, just some tiny little light in this darkness that we have here, and that is that our society have now created something that is called the Virus and Pandemic Foundation. So we'd like to, of course, strengthen Swedish virology. We also would like to share the knowledge about virus caused diseases. So I hope that in the spirit of what you're talking about here, that we will together join forces, hook arms in a way, and work together to fight these uh, terrible things. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yes, but uh, let me give someone else the word, Stefan, before I go over to you. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. My name is Joran Kolsen, Professor of Applied Ethics. And my question is uh, concerns vaccines and what we have learned. I mean, there are some two basic uh, movements, or you could say, when it, has to, when it comes to distribution and global distribution of vaccines. The one is COVAX, which is, of course, a new and quite unique uh, initiative. The other is a temporary limitation of the patent rights on uh, through the WTO. Uh, I would ask you to respond to the, will this be in some way permanent possibilities in the future, or are we back in uh, in the first uh, in the starting place, so to say, when the next pandemic comes? How will, what have we learned from this? Mm. Thank you. Do you want to take a Lenny and then Anders maybe? And maybe you might explain COVAX and WTO. Or do you, I don't know if you want to take that on, <laughs> so everybody knows. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, this is a very good question in, indeed. And uh, I'm sure some, something will be different from the next pandemics. Because now, those who have been, for example, Africa, who have been relying on support from UNICEF and Gavi, for all the vaccine supply, cha supply chain and also investment. Now they know that there is a need to build the capacity locally and manufacture vaccines. And there are initiatives now ongoing. And the leading one is Rwanda, South Africa, and from the West Africa also. But at the same time, how vaccine uh, supply is, is established for Africa is it comes through purchased through the UNICEF, but there should be commitment from the local African countries to buy and purchase 
so the locally produced vaccine so that there will be sustainability. So this has to also change how the vaccine supply system is now currently focusing on local bar manufacturing and are also used on purchase and, and uh, uh, investment at the local level. This is what I think we should learn from, from the current pandemics. Good points. Um, do, you, do you want to just explain what COVAX is first, Anders, so COVAX. everybody knows? The COVAX is a platform to try to pool and coordinate co um, procurement of vaccine basically for the whole world, both for low and middle income countries, but also for some self-financing countries. To answer the question, uh, I don't think we should keep COVAX. I don't think we should keep the platform neither for what we call Act A for diagnostic and treatment, but we need a platform. We need a pre-negotiated platform. Uh, but we have a world that will need this, and we have different parts of the world that are now have built quite a lot of capacity. So if you take the African uh, continent with the African Union, they've got their own platform called AVAT. The Americas, they've got theirs. The Asians have got theirs. We have got ours in Europe. I think we need rather to buy a platform, or, uh, build a platform of a club of buyers. You have different buyers, but you need to coordinate and you need to agree on some principles. And the most important one is to agree on the principles of the flow. There's been a lot of talk about equity, that everybody should have, have the same right. For me, it's much more in terms of how do we make best public health use of the vaccines and how do we get the flow of this. So one is then the just the coordination. And I think it was a good attempt by COVAX, and I think we should applaud them what they have done. But I don't think it's the right solution for the future. We need to recognize that this is a global, we need a global platform to connect the world basically for basically that. On the patents right and the WTO, that's about what you need, the end-to-end -end process here, <laughs> from sharing the genetic sequence, making sure that we uh, engage with the industry, uh, the discovery, the research, do we use the patent or not, and then going into production and all of that. So that's a, quite a long chain of different components. And my personal view, I think it's been too much focus on just sort of releasing the patent right here. I think, yes, that might be helpful when it comes to targeted situations, uh, but I think it's been too much political focus on that. I think you need to recognize that you need a chain here from the beginning, sharing the genetic sequences. We have good examples for how we do with pandemic influenza every year. That works quite nicely. So, and I think we need to learn more. How do we do that? And in terms of building capacity, African, the African continent is important, 90-95% of the vaccines. But it's not easy then to build a competitive manufacturing capacity. Already now, the capacity in South Africa has big challenges because they can't produce the vaccines at the price that someone will buy. I need to unfortunately yeah. cut you off, so it's, but it's, uh, we uh, can. It's a, it's a and I'm question, sorry, Stefan, you didn't get a chance to ask your question. Um, and but so, thank you so much, especially to my panel, all of you, and to all of you for uh, staying here um, and listening. And uh, this uh, will also be available afterwards to share and listen to on YouTube. Um, and please, uh, I'm sure that we're all willing to take a couple questions afterwards. Um, so welcome and thank you so much again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>